history tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 72nd episode of the History Goes Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And today we are featuring the life and afterlife of Bruce Lee. This one was Denise's choice. Yes, it was, because I absolutely love Bruce Lee and always have. And you know, when you look at his history, it really is amazing how famous he became because he didn't live a very long life. No, he didn't, and he lived a very tumultuous life in the short time he was here, too. Indeed, and he ran up against a lot of discrimination because, as we've talked about in Hollywood, there were certain groups that just weren't really presented out there the way they should have been. And a lot of it had to do with the almighty dollar. And how foolish, because look at what a superstar Bruce Lee is. I mean, 20th century pop culture is got Bruce Lee at the top. Well, and just the the mere fact of his talent that they wouldn't let that out there. Instead, they would train other actors to be something he could have naturally been because he was so amazing. Exactly. Before we do that, we want to point you in the direction of our website. You can check out everything you'd want to know about the show at historygoesbump.com. And Denise, if people would like to send us some feedback about the show or we're still looking for your Halloween stories, true, real ghost stories, something that you've experienced or someone that you know has... Where can they do that, Denise? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And we do want to welcome Anne-Marie to the Spooktacular crew. Yes, welcome, Anne-Marie. And don't forget, we are having a meetup on October 11th in St. Augustine at the St. Augustine Lighthouse. If you want details about that, just check out the event tab at the website. Yes, and definitely get registered sooner rather than later because we'd hate for somebody to make the trek and have the tour be filled up. So if you're going to join us, please register. And right now it looks like we have about seven. Yes, yes, That's it's going to be very exciting. And we get to go into the lighthouse at night. It's going to be groovy, very groovy. Especially with your fear of heights, you're going to be <laughs> loving it. <laughs> All right, Denise, are you ready to share a little bit about Bruce Lee? I am. Become an executive producer of the History Goes Bump podcast for as little as a buck a month. For $5 a month, you can access exclusive content like the Haunted True Crime bonus cast. And for $10 and above a month, you get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump for more information. Or you can give us a one-time donation by clicking the donate button at historygoesbump.com. Germany had some really weird rules in the distant past. There were clothing laws that made wearing certain items forbidden. Poor Magdalena Schlotlin was wearing a neckerchief when she ran afoul of the law. The reason why was because the neckerchief was too large for her station in life. She was hauled before the court where she explained the item had been a gift. This was her third offense with wearing the neckerchief and she was fined four days wages. At one time, Germany had 1,350 laws dictating what people could and could not wear. Men were supportive of the laws because they didn't have to meet their wives' wishes for new clothing items. And hey, you guys out there, don't get any ideas. The same battle over a neckerchief happened to another woman in 1684. Items made from silk or calico were strictly forbidden. Ham Jacob Atiel, a weaver's son, was fined about two weeks' earnings in 1662, quote, on account of the very wide trousers he has been wearing, which fashion he is not entitled to, and threatened that if he should again put on such trousers of this fashion, they shall, by virtue of the princely command, be confiscated, end quote. Several couples were fined for inviting more than 12 people to their weddings. Thirty groups of unmarried people were fined for holding dances. One poor woman in 1687 appealed to the court for welfare, but because she and her son had been seen in clothing above their station in life, help was refused to her. The Germany of old certainly had some laws that were very odd. I'm your 
afraid of the dark. This day in history. On this day, September 28th in 1850, the United States Navy abolishes flogging as a form of punishment. It may be hard to believe, but there was a time when flogging was used as discipline for sailors. Whipping was administered via a cat o' nine tails, which was a whip formed from nine knotted ropes. It was believed that this kind of punishment was more effective than confinement and got sailors back to work quickly. Congress decided to abolish the punishment. They did not offer alternatives, so the Navy tuned into dousing with seawater, jailing sailors in sweat boxes, tattooing, branding, wearing signs of disgrace, lashing with thumbs behind the back, tricing up by the wrist, straight jackets, and locking seamen in irons and providing only bread and water. The Navy believed these punishments were needed because insubordination and desertion rose without the use of flogging. Commodore Matthew C. Perry tried raising morale to instill good behavior. And guess what? It worked. In 1855, Congress followed this path and came up with a system of rewards and punishments that worked much better than flogging and carries over into our modern era. Hello, kitties. Fall has fallen, and fall means the Wicked Library Halloween special is nearly here. It will be recorded live in front of a captive audience at Rickett and Beagle Books on October 17th from 7 to 9 p.m., and the show will air on October 31st, Halloween in other words. It's also going to be getting cold in our little village of the damned. So, in addition to the great prizes, tricks and treats, and other wicked fun, we're doing a little something we're calling blankets and books. Bring a clean used blanket to sit on for story time, and then leave the blanket before you're released. I mean before you go. Rickett and Beagle Books will be donating a book along with every blanket collected. Both items will be donated to the Hot Metal Bridge Faith community to distribute to the homeless. We hope you'll come by, but if you absolutely can't shamble down and still want to donate a blanket and maybe even a book of your own, drop me a line at librarian at thewickedlibrary.com and we'll get you more information. See you at Rickett and Beagle Books on the 17th, kiddies! <laughs> the History Goes Bump Podcast. Just the mere mention of the name Bruce Lee conjures visions of martial arts fighting and movies. Bruce Lee fought discrimination to become the most famous American of Asian descent. He is considered the most influential martial artist of all time. Fame was elusive, and once found, it perhaps was not what Bruce Lee had dreamed it would be. His candle did not burn long as he died at the young age of 32. Some say that it was a curse that took his life a curse that carried over and took the life of his actor son, Brandon Lee, as well. Could it be the early deaths of these two young men that has led to their spirits being at unrest? Was it a curse that plagued the Lees? Come with us as we explore the life and afterlife of Bruce Lee. Lee Jun Van was born in the year and hour of the dragon on November 27, 1940, in San Francisco, California. The timing of his birth was a powerful omen in Chinese astrology, that he would lead a powerful life with much impact. Hey, Diane, guess who else is Year of the Dragon? I knew you were going (laughs) to say something about that. Indeed, Denise is Year of the Dragon as well. A powerful omen. (laughs) But you weren't born in necessarily the hour. We don't know exactly about that. I need to find out when that hour is because you don't know. (laughs) Well, I know you've had a hell of an impact on me. (laughs) 
His mother, Grace Ho, was half Chinese and half Caucasian and came from a wealthy family. Her clan was one of the most powerful in Hong Kong. His father was Li Ho Chien, and he was Han Chinese. His career was in the Cantonese opera, and he was one of the leading actors in both that and film at the time. Li Jun Fan was given his name by his mother, and it means to arouse and make prosperous. Dr. Mary Glover, who was the attending physician, gave Jun Fan the name Bruce. The family would use neither name, and they called Bruce by the nickname Seifan, meaning Little Peacock. The Lees used this nickname because they were superstitious and believed the gods would take away a male child if they disapproved of that child. Seifan is a girl nickname, and perhaps the Lees felt they could fool the gods with that name. The reason they feared losing Bruce is because they had lost their firstborn son in infancy. After Bruce was born, the family returned to Hong Kong, and Bruce was raised there. The Lee family had been in America on tour with the opera. He began his career in martial arts in Wing Chun when he was 13 under Master Yip Man. Bruce referred to his martial art as Gung Fu, which is Cantonese for Kung Fu. Bruce appeared in several films as a child actor, and he appeared in 20 films by the time he was 18. He loved acting and would jump out of bed at midnight to make a film. But if someone tried to wake him for school, he would just roll over. He also took up dance, which went with his martial arts studies. He actually competed in dance and in 1958 won the Hong Kong Cha-Cha Championship. And the thing that's very interesting about that, his, his master, Master Yip Man, was an amazing man because a lot of the students didn't want Bruce Lee in that class because of his heritage and because he did have, he wasn't full Chinese. Wow, so he went ahead and accepted him, which will explain in the future why Bruce Lee is the same way when he's a teacher as well. I had no idea that Bruce Lee was a dancer. Yeah, and he actually taught dance for a while as well. Wow, and he had to have been very good if he was winning a championship. That would go hand in hand with martial arts. Right, and the other thing that it doesn't go into as much, but the martial arts became such a driving force in his life because I really clicked on when it, we were researching for this one, I really clicked on because he was getting into trouble with street fighting and stuff like that. So, Uh-oh, so he was hanging out with some street gangs? Yep. Not good. And that was kind of a little bit of why I got involved too, because... You both were fighters and you just needed somewhere to put that energy. Yes, we did. And we were both Year of the Dragon, but that's about as cool as I get to be as far as Bruce I was Lee is say, concerned. Was After he, that, I go downhill and he rises to infamous, infamacy. Yeah, where, where's the fame and money? I Somehow we're missing that here. <laughs> that's because I wasn't <laughs> even... I couldn't even dream of being as good as Bruce Lee. The Lee family had been in America when Bruce was born because they were on tour with the opera. Because Bruce was born in America, he was able to claim American citizenship, and he did that when he was 18 and boarded a ship bound for San Francisco with only $100 in his pocket. He headed to Washington to attend the University of Washington in Seattle. And before that, he had to go to a remedial school because he was really bad at grades. So he had to do a little bit of extra work so he could get into the university. Yeah, he was not a hero growing up. He was kind of running with the wrong the wrong kids, so to speak. I have a feeling as we get further into this, people are going to see that he would have been one of those kids they would have put on Ritalin. What a tragedy that would have been because he was just very high energy. Yes, he was. He decided to start his own Gung Fu school while in Seattle and he opened Jun Fan Gung Fu Institute. It met in a very small rented basement room. As the school grew, Bruce was able to rent a larger location on University Way, and there was a room in the back big enough to serve as a living space. One of his students was a girl named Linda. The two soon fell in love and married in 1964. Bruce decided that teaching Gung Fu would be his career, and he started making plans to open schools around the country. He left his Seattle school to his assistant and good friend, Taki Kimura, and moved with Linda to Oakland, where they opened another Gung Fu Institute. Bruce decided that Gung Fu was not as complete a martial art as it could be, and he developed Jeet Kune Do, which is what he is definitely known for. This decision arose from an incident in his martial arts school. A group of Chinese instructors came and told him they disapproved of him teaching Caucasians their art. They challenged Bruce to a duel of sorts. Bruce won, but he was disappointed that it took him three minutes to pin the main guy. He decided then that he needed to improve his art. As he continued with his art, he was asked to give a demonstration at the first international karate tournament. Bruce was charismatic and spectacular, and in the audience sat Jay Sebring. You may recognize that name because Sebring was one of the victims of the Manson family murders. Sebring was a hairstylist to the stars, and he told one of his clients, who was a Hollywood producer, William Dozier, about Bruce Lee. 
The producer was looking for someone to play Charlie Chan's son, so he gave Bruce a call. After an impressive screen test, Dozier was positive he wanted to work with Bruce. Unfortunately, the Chan movie project fell through, but Dozier gave Bruce $1,800 and promised him that if the Batman TV series proved to be successful, he had plans to start a Green Hornet show and Bruce would be given the part of Cato. At this same time, Linda gave birth to the couple's first child, Brandon. After hearing about the new grandchild, Bruce's father died. Bruce decided to use the money Dozier gave him to take the family to Hong Kong so everyone there could meet Linda and his newborn son. They spent four months there and then flew to Seattle to spend time with Linda's family. They decided to relocate to Los Angeles because Bruce had decided that martial arts might be his passion, but his career choice was acting. Production of The Green Hornet began in 1966. They filmed for six months, and though the series was fairly popular, it was not renewed for another season. People loved watching Bruce perform his moves, which he slowed down considerably so the camera could catch them. Fame was elusive, and Bruce began to think he'd made a bad decision. Between 1967 and 1971, he was only able to land a few bit parts on TV and in film. His daughter Shannon was born in 1969. In order to provide better, Bruce took on celebrity clients and taught them Jet Kune Do. In 1970, he sustained an injury to his back that was so severe he was ordered to bed rest and told he would never do Kung Fu again. He was in bed for six months. He then pursued his own recovery and began walking, working his way back up to full strength. He would live with the pain of the injury the rest of his life. But he obviously was able to do Kung Fu again because we haven't even gotten into his major movies yet. And they, we know he does martial arts in those. You know who one of his celebrity clients was? Steve McQueen. Oh, another one who, yeah. And they were so close that he actually was one of the pallbearers at his funeral. Okay, that one I didn't know. While he had been stuck in bed, Bruce came up with the idea of a TV series centered around an Eastern monk who traveled throughout the Old West. He pitched the idea to Warner Brothers, and the TV series Kung Fu was born. Bruce anticipated playing in the starring role, but the part was given to David Carradine, and Bruce was left disappointed. No one thought a Chinese man would be bankable. Bruce headed to Hong Kong with Brandon, who was five at the time, to visit family. Bruce was amazed to find that he had become fairly well-known there. Everyone referred to him as Cato, and Hong Kong filmmakers started approaching him. Bruce decided that this could be his backdoor into Hollywood, and he made the movie Fists of Fury. The film was a huge success. And it is interesting that they would choose a white guy to play a Chinese guy over an amazingly talented Chinese man who already knew Kung Fu. Yeah, I mean, David Carradine was good in Kung Mm -hmm. Fu and everything, but how much better would it have been with Bruce Lee? Oh, I can't even imagine how good, because I loved Kung Fu growing up. That was like one of my favorite shows, with or without, you know, Bruce Lee. But if Bruce Lee had been in it, now looking back, because I didn't know that he'd been put down for the part and it was his idea but that's part of that discrimination that we talked about exactly and he did a ton of writing while he was in bed he didn't just lay there he wrote a bunch of philosophy books and a bunch of uh, the culture behind the martial arts and and of course then he came up with some of these ideas for movies and tv as well and so I don't know if it's 100% true, but during my research, the uh, like officially he put out that he majored in philosophy, I think, because he wanted to spread the philosophy of his art and he loved it. But his actual school record showed that he majored in drama instead. Now, isn't that interesting? Because that's where he said he wanted his career was to go into acting. So drama, you would think, would be at his heart. But yeah, I guess you sound smarter if you're like, oh, yeah, I studied philosophy, not drama. Well, especially, mar- you know, martial arts or uh, kung fu or jet kundo, you know, master. So it, it, who knows? Or maybe he studied both, but, but his official record said drama. So I thought that was interesting. Fist of Fury was a sequel to Fist of Fury, and it did even better. Bruce had been under contract for those two movies, and now he was free. He moved on to his next project, Return of the Dragon, which he wrote, directed, and produced. It proved to be a box office smash, and Hollywood started paying attention. In 1972, Bruce was in the middle of Game of Death when Warner Brothers approached him about making a movie in collaboration with Hong Kong. This movie would be Enter the Dragon. Bruce put Game of Death on hold. Filming was tough because of language barriers, and Bruce was stressed as he wanted this movie to really impress American audiences. They got it finished, and it was scheduled to premiere in August of 1973 at the Hollywood Chinese Theater. Bruce would not live to see that premiere and his crowning achievement. On July 20, 1973, Bruce experienced a headache. 
It was not severe, but he needed something to dull the pain. A friend gave him Equagesix, which was a prescription painkiller. For a minor headache, Bruce went to lie down and could not be roused later. He was in a coma. He was rushed to the hospital where he died. The coroner who conducted the first autopsy was unable to determine what had happened. The top forensic pathologists were flown in, and it was finally determined that Bruce had an allergic reaction to an ingredient in the pill. That allergic reaction caused his brain to swell. No one has been completely satisfied with this answer. There was cannabis found in his stomach, but everyone agreed it had nothing to do with the death. Interestingly, a couple months earlier, Bruce had collapsed with convulsions and swelling of the brain after eating hashish from Nepal, which was considered to be very pure. At the autopsy, no other drugs were found in Bruce's system other than the painkiller and the cannabis. It should be pointed out that he was terribly unhealthy when he died. He had only 1% body fat, and so he was far too thin. He was depressed and would fly into rages. Something was not quite right with him. Was it possible that Bruce was murdered? Some believe the Triad gang had put a hit on Bruce for multiple reasons. Others thought that a jealous fellow martial artist had given him a death touch strike called a dim mac. Denise, this one is going to confound people for forever. They're never going to know because even now, I don't think there's any way that you could really search to see what was going on. But here's what I find interesting. Which came first, as they say, the chicken or the egg? He has a headache and then he has swelling of the brain. Did he have a headache because he already had swelling of the brain going on, possibly? I mean, that's a very, very good possibility. And then everything else just kind of expounded that. Did they test the cannabis in his stomach to see if there was something in that that might have reacted with this painkiller? And there is a rumor. We'll get into the seedy side of things here. Bruce was not necessarily faithful in his marriage. Bruce was having a meeting with the director of Game of Death at his home. And I think there was another producer or something there. And then they went to go talk to the female co-star at her house. At least Bruce went there. And then they were supposed to meet up with the director of Game of Death later for dinner. Supposedly, this woman, maybe he and her were having some kind of an affair. And some people wonder if the triad gangs were not using her to get to Bruce in order to do this to him. And do you know why the triad gangs would be after him, Denise? Yeah, well, they were kind of like the Chinese mafia, and so they wanted protection money from him, and he refused to pay, so they threatened both Bruce Lee and Brandon, his son. So it makes you wonder, did she give him something that would do this? Because here's the other thing that I just do not understand. Denise, if you have a friend who comes over to your house, and you've given them something for a headache, and they go to lay down, and then you go in to wake them up because you're supposed to go to dinner, and you can't get them to stir, what would you do? Call 911 and then start CPR. Okay, so I don't know how long she was trying to rouse him, but finally the director calls because they're late for dinner. So I'm thinking if you're rousing him before you're going to go to dinner, there's some time that has gone here. And she says, well, I can't get Bruce to wake up. Then if you're the director, don't you think you'd say, we'll call 911? So then he comes over. So all this time is going. Who knows if they could have done something to save him? So all this time is going here. He finally shows up and he's like, oh, we better call the doctor. So they call a doctor who's nearby. He comes over and of course he can't get him roused. And I'm still going, why is this man not at the hospital already? This is insane. So then the doctor is the one who calls the ambulance. And by the time he gets to the hospital, he's already dead. And then they didn't want anybody to know what had really happened. So there were all these rumors about, did he die at home? Did he not die at home? Well, he wasn't at home, period. So his death either happened at this woman's house or at the hospital. And I don't know if they didn't want people to know that he was at this woman's house or what have you. All I know for sure is that Linda, his wife, doesn't want people to talk about it anymore. And she doesn't seem to care about what killed him. She just said he's dead. And I don't want to hear any more rumors about it. We'll leave it at that. I personally would want some justice, but yeah, or, you know, it's just like rehashing because his name getting run through the mud. And maybe she's just like, let me just remember who he was. That and- could be too. Who knows? She may not have known that he was possibly having this affair and didn't want that to come out. So Bruce was laid to rest wearing the traditional Chinese outfit that he had donned in the movie Enter the Dragon. He was buried at Lakeview Cemetery in Seattle, Washington. Bruce had not wanted to live a long life. He feared losing his physical abilities. He often told Linda, quote, if I should die tomorrow, I will have no regrets. I did what I wanted to do. You can't expect more from life, end quote. So he missed his greatest achievement, didn't get to see the fame that came with it, or maybe he did. <laughs> well, and one of the things that's kind of strange there that just dawned on me is that if he was already not wanting to live and, and it was already his, his body was starting to break down on him, he'd had the back injury, he was in constant pain. 
it could have possibly even been some sort of a suicide. You know, I wasn't going to say that, but I did have that thought today when I was thinking about this earlier. And I thought, I wonder if he might have killed himself. He was just done. He was tired. And maybe he knew that this was going to be it for the film. And I can't remember if it was one of the executive producers, something to the effect of, I don't mean to be crass, but him passing away probably made that movie even more successful than it would have been. One of the strangest items in the biography of Bruce Lee are rumors about a family curse. It's similar to the Kennedy curse. Although I have to tell you, I could not find the origins for this. I just know that the firstborn son died and that they were worried that Bruce was going to die. So I, I don't know the Kennedy curse. They talk about that the Kennedy father might have made a deal with the devil for his son children to be successful and everything and for him to be successful. So I don't know if that's what's going on here, but Bruce once had a premonition after the death of his father. In this premonition, he saw himself dying when he reached half the age his father was when he passed away. His father was 64 at the time of his death. Bruce did indeed die when he was only 32. Bruce described another incident in which a dark shadow came upon him and held him down for several minutes. No matter how hard he tried, he could not get the shadow off of himself. He was drenched in sweat when the entity finally left. Bruce said it was one of the few times he had physically been defeated. And we'll get into talking about that in a little bit. Was this death following him? Bruce kept a mirror in his home to ward off evil spirits. That mirror blew away in a typhoon shortly before his death. I believe it was the day before. There has been no real definitive cause of death for Bruce, which leaves the door open for this kind of speculation about what really killed him. Not only was Bruce's death part of this curse, but the death of his son Brandon also seems to be linked. We don't believe in coincidences around here, so when we consider that Bruce's character in the movie Game of Death fakes his death in the way that Brandon died, it makes us wonder. In the movie, Bruce is playing an actor who is shot and dies in a scene, and it turns out that he actually has really been shot. He doesn't die, but everyone thinks he has, so he goes with it and comes back to wreak revenge. Brandon was killed when pieces of a real bullet flew out of a gun that was supposed to be firing blanks and hit him. The improbability of an actor dying on the set from a real gunshot leads to speculation. Perhaps both men just simply passed away from freak causes. And I'm unsure exactly of what happened with that gun that shot Brandon, because I've heard two different things. One of them is that this had real pieces of a bullet in it for some reason. And so then when the blank came out... There was real bullet with it, and that's why it was able to fly and hit him. But I also saw that it was actually loaded with real ammo, and he was shot three times. So I'm not sure which one of those is the truth. I don't understand how a gun that is supposed to be for blanks would have had real bullets in it. It just Well, and it's interesting. One of the, the reports of the death of Brandon Lee that I was reading said that a lot of the checks that they're supposed to go through whenever they have a scene like that, because it's not just like, oh, put the gun on the set and let's go. There's mm -hmm. a lot of A, B, C, and D that has to be followed whenever they're shooting something, even if it is blanks towards an actor. And a lot of that was not done the night that Brandon died. So it kind of is that kind of might go back from the curse to more of a conspiracy with a Chinese mafia or somebody like that or the triad group. So. Yeah, that somebody switched out the gun. That's kind of what I'm hinting towards because I just don't understand why you'd have parts of a real bullet in a gun that is supposed to fire blanks. I just to me, that would be the stupidest thing Hollywood could ever do is to have a, a gun that would be a real gun on set. The only other actor that I've heard about, and it was only because I had a crush on him and his poster on my wall, was back when I was a teenager, there was this model who starred in a couple of TV shows called John Eric Hexum. And one day they had a gun on set that had a bunch of blanks in it, and they were playing Russian roulette with it. And when he put the gun to his temple and fired it, it there was at least enough force from the blank that it shot part of his skull into his brain and it killed him. But that's the only time I've heard of a blank gun killing somebody like this. So it does make you wonder. And another little quinky dink between Brandon and his dad. A is... quinky dink? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to keep that word in Diane's dictionary. A quadink, qu quadinky dink? Quinky dink. Quinky dink. Is that uh, Brandon was making the movie The Crow, and this was going to be one of his most successful films of all time. And it's a cult classic to this day. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. they weren't completely done filming it. So they had to do some weird rigging of things in order to finish it so that it appeared that Brandon was still there to finish the movie. But they didn't really need Brandon to finish the movie. And that was like 
the only night there was not that many people around. It was mm-hmm. darker, and so it would have been the prime time to take his life because they could still release the movie without him physically being there. And it would be interesting to hear from some of our listeners who are Crow aficionados. Mm-hmm. Maybe you've read the comic book or the graphic novel. You know the movie a little bit better. I I saw the movie way back when it first came out, and I don't really remember it that well. But I think there were parts of the Crow that kind of... I don't know. There's that paranormal type connection there with it, that there was some significance and symbolism in the movie that kind of went with him dying in it. And I don't know, it's just some, some of that oddity stuff that we talk about. As we mentioned earlier, Bruce Lee had a run in with a dark entity. He worked at Ruby Chow's restaurant at one time, and the place was reportedly haunted by a shadow figure. This figure was seen by a cook and he quit immediately. A busser was jostled by something unseen as she took a tray of dishes into the kitchen. A teapot on the tray was tipped over and liquid spilled to the ground. She claimed that the liquid formed into a question mark. Again, maybe just another coincidence, but since we don't believe in those. The owner of the restaurant, Ruby, claimed she saw the shadowy figure and that it pinned her to the ground. The same thing happened to Bruce as we described earlier. I guess the way that he got out of this is that he managed to deal a blow to the entity, so it must take on some kind of physicality. So it's not just ethereal that he was able to actually hit it, and when he did, it disappeared. Bruce told that story often, and the incident left him shaken, as if he had fought death itself. Hmm. Whether it was their youth or the circumstances of their death, both the spirits of Bruce and Brandon are rumored to still be here in the afterlife. There are many stories of sightings of both men at the place where their graves are located. We have a picture in the show notes today, and it features a young man. He's sitting kind of like in the lotus position in front of Bruce Lee's tombstone, and he's bending forward, and at the very bottom, there's a weird lens flare. Now, we could explain this away. The picture was supposedly taken in 2005. Maybe it was something with the camera and the sunshine coming down, but you can't see the guy's legs because there's this blurry, almost ethereal glowing image there at the base of the picture. But even though we could explain that away, when you guys look at the tombstone, it has the picture of Bruce Lee there. And then to the when you're looking at the picture to the left of that, it almost looks like there's a shadow, which you might think would be the person who's actually taking the picture. Now, if that is true, then this person, depending upon the way this is facing, I mean, it literally looks like the profile of what Bruce Lee is looking like in the picture that's on his actual tombstone. This person would have to have short hair if they were looking straight ahead because, again, if they're taking the picture, they're not going to be looking sideways profile. You don't do that to take a picture. You'd be looking right at the person to take the picture. So I would assume this person would be looking straight on. They'd have to have short hair the way this shadow is. So the young man, this picture we got it from the Ghosts and Critters website. And the guy who runs that website had asked this guy who took the picture. And he said his girlfriend had taken the picture and that she had long hair. So I'm thinking this could not be the shadow of the person who's taking the picture. So the picture is quite interesting. So check it out. See what you think. Is it Bruce Lee hanging out or Brandon? They're both, uh, their tombstones are there right next to each other side by side. They're very nice tombstones, by the way. I'd love to go see him someday. Bruce Lee lived a short life but he is one of the most famous individuals in the world. Has he returned because of unfinished business? Is his ghost really seen, or are people imagining that his spirit remains? That is for you to decide. And I did find a long article that featured a psychic who was channeling Bruce Lee, and I was reading through the questions and answers, and it was interesting, but, you know, what I think about a lot of that stuff. So I I found that one, too, and I kind of... I, I mean, I read it for interest, but I mm-hmm. kind of just discarded it when yeah. we were researching. I was like, eh, maybe, maybe not. Exactly. It was almost too pat and dry. Yeah. I mean, it was basically the answers that you would expect Bruce Lee to give, like what killed you? Oh, it was the pill I took. Okay. Yeah, right. Just that pat and dry. I mean, mm-hmm. plus we don't know what happens after you die, but maybe you don't know why you died because maybe, especially if you get to go to heaven or what have you, you're not going to have any bad memories or pain or anything. So I don't know that you're going to remember what happened to you because that would be probably painful. Dying, I don't think is a joyous experience. Yeah. 
Well, Denise, we have October coming right around the corner. Lots of great shows. We're going to kick it off with our one year anniversary. It's, going to oh, be a lot it's been of fun. one year. What a ride it's been. Indeed. So we hope you guys can join us for that one. It is going to be the longest show that we have put together thus far. And we are going to introduce you to our History Goes Bump research crew. And we'll answer some questions that uh, you guys have posed to us. Yes, we will. Thanks for listening to this one. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. Executive producers of this podcast have been... Amy Connor. Dave and Ann Student. Heather Williams. Jade Lewis. Stephen Pappas. Janice Carlson. Dan Foytik. Rachel Cooper. Levi Drescher. And Leanna Sapien. Thank you. Want to keep the spooks away? Give us a review.